What's up guys, Jared here with another more personal vlog. I enjoy talking about bad movies almost as much as good ones, and the search for the worst film of all time is something I think about a lot. To name a few of the common contenders, The Room. I did not hit her, it's not true, it's bull I did not hit her, I did not. Troll 2. Oh my god! Anything by Uwe Boll, Manos, The Hands of Fate, Super Geniuses, Baby Geniuses 2, Birdemic, or anything by Jason Friedman and Aaron Seltzer. And while these movies are clearly bad, I'll never be convinced that any of them deserve the distinction of worst ever. Why? Well, being bad just isn't enough. For me, to earn the title of worst ever, it needs to be tragic. So join me on this journey into the abyss in this vlog on my pick for the worst movie ever made. First, let's establish what constitutes a bad movie. Everyone has their own criteria, which usually include awful dialogue. Breezy. I'm feeling hot. I find that unlikely. Nonsensical plot, bad lighting and sound, or cheesy special effects. But in my mind, there's an important distinction between a bad movie and a tragic movie. We can all easily spot a bad movie, but a movie's tragic potential lies in the discrepancy between its ambitions and its actual achievement. Basically, the harder a movie tries, the harder it can fail, and when it does, oh boy, does it hurt. I think Francis Ford Coppola said it best while on the set of Apocalypse Now. Nothing is so terrible as a pretentious movie. I mean, a movie that aspires for something really terrific and doesn't pull it off is shit. it's scum, and everyone will walk on it as such, and that's why poor filmmakers, in a way, that's their greatest horror, is to be pretentious. Sure, the recent Fantastic Four flick may be bad, but it's just bad at being a fun superhero movie. But my pick for the worst movie ever is bad at being a monumental sci-fi pop art magnum opus that penetrates the social and political anxieties of America circa 2006. I'm talking about Donnie Darko director Richard Kelly's sophomore effort, Southland Tales, starring Dwayne Johnson, Sarah Michelle Gellar, and Sean William Scott. Some of you may have never heard of it, and some of you may be saying, hey, I like this film, or I've seen it and it's not that bad. I know people who like it too, and if it works for you, great. This is just my opinion. Leave your stupid comments in your pocket. Whether you love it or hate it, you gotta admit, this film is just one audacious swing for the fences after another. It is an onslaught of ambition. Believe me, I appreciate risk taking in film, but one of the harsh realities of being an artist is coming to terms with the fact that the harder you swing, the harder you can miss. And make no mistake, even though I dislike this film, Richard Kelly is still a badass in my book for making something bold. Although not a theatrical success, Donnie Darko had amassed a cult following and killed it in DVD sales by the time Southland Tales had been greenlit. So Kelly, like most people with that kind of success under their belt, was probably thinking that he was a genius. As a result, nobody questioned any of his creative decisions. He was given complete control to do whatever he wanted. Sometimes this can be great, and sometimes it can be bad. This is an example of when it goes bad. So what makes this film so tragic? An obvious criteria for a bad film is that the plot is either unbelievable, incomprehensible, or just plain uninteresting. Southland Tales takes place in a post-nuclear 2008, where World War III is currently being fought and American streets are heavily militarized. The Patriot Act has been expanded into the Big Brother-esque US ident. Ew, you're doing bathroom detail? And the neo-Marxist movement is trying to tear it to the ground. We follow Boxer Santoros, an amnesiac movie star with vague prophecies of the world's end, and Officer Roland Havner, a cop dealing with PTSD. The dude from The Princess Bride figures out how to solve the energy crisis using the ocean and quantum entanglement, causing a rift in the fourth dimension that has made duplicates of Boxer and Roland. Roland finds his past self, shakes his hand, and ends the world, the end. Honestly, just from that recap, the film might even sound cool. But then again, the short pitch of man struggles with his wife's infidelity can describe both The Room and American Beauty, so it's often the execution that matters more. Regardless, the film takes on big themes relevant to the late 2000s. American militarism, celebrity culture, consumerism, resource scarcity, climate catastrophe, and political polarization. And what does it have to say about these things? It's hard to say because the film doesn't make a ton of sense. That's partly due to the fact that, like a certain galaxy far, far away, we start the story four chapters in. I actually saw this film at an early screen 
screening in 2007 at Fantastic Fest. I remember after the movie ended, Richard Kelly handed everyone in the audience three Southland Tales prequel graphic novels and told us, it makes more sense after you read these. According to Wisecrack writer and fellow festival attendee Tommy Cook, it did not. But what really makes this movie tragic is that any attempt to speak to these big issues is undercut by how off-putting the film's tone is. One of the most important things for a film to achieve is a strong, consistent tone, and Southland Tales never really finds one. At its worst, the film tries really hard to maintain a tone of deep introspection, but ends up sounding like pseudo-profound, ominous-sounding gibberish. Do you ever feel like there's a thousand people locked inside of you? Sometimes, yeah. But it's your memory that keeps them glued together. It keeps all those people from fighting one another. Maybe in the end, that's all we have. The memory gospel. As a result, the film ends up feeling like a grab bag of incomplete ideas propped up by a mysterious tone. When you're dealing with really important topics, but the only thing you can offer is the air of importance, it gets cringy fast. Now what takes this to next level tragic for me is that Kelly actually did a really smart thing and tried to blend his self-serious condemnation of modern decadence with some comedy to lessen the weight. Problem is, we get this. If you don't let me suck your I'm gonna kill myself. Yeah, it just doesn't work. The jokes that are supposed to balance out the sense of foreboding come off as too bombastic and result in something that feels tonally dissonant for the whole two plus hours. This brings us to another hallmark of bad filmmaking, dialogue. The mark of bad dialogue is usually that it's too generic or on the nose. I haven't been happy since I married my first husband. I didn't even want to marry your father. The best way I can describe the dialogue in Southland Tales is deliberately cryptic, pseudo-mysterious gibberish. You're not really here. Who am I? None of your business. Now get the f out of here. Basically, the characters say vague, poetic-sounding lines that perhaps sound thoughtful when you first hear them, but if you think about it for more than a second, you realize it's just cryptic for the sake of being cryptic. We saw the shadows of the morning light, shadows of the evening sun, until light and shadows were one. Go, before it is too late. The movie is trying to get you to say, whoa, deep but it's not. The first lines we hear Sarah Michelle Gellar's character say is a completely spontaneous stigma. Couple that with getting to hear Justin Timberlake whisper unrelated Bible verses throughout the movie. Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to shew unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And Jesus bleeding into the rock's back, and you've got yourself one of the least subtle and least motivated Christ motifs ever. I really don't know what this is supposed to mean. The rock is dying on a zeppelin in order for the world to end? This is how it all had to go down in order for the world to start anew, so he knowingly died there? I don't know. I could sit here all day and do the heavy lifting to make this movie seem deep, but in my mind, a movie has to motivate me to do that work, with awesome characters, a compelling story, etc. So again, high ambition, abysmal delivery. Another very important criteria for identifying a bad movie is performance. No, no, we can't stay here. It'll be fine, no, I'll clean it up. There's no Don't way worry in hell about we it. can stay here, no. This one is hard to argue with. Bad performances are one of the few things that an audience will never forgive. Your film can have egregious sound problems or be horribly lit, and it won't matter if the audience cares about the characters. But if the audience doesn't buy into the performances, your movie has no chance. But for me, a movie reaches the heights of tragedy when you have good actors trying their best to make a bad script work. This film is saturated with great performers having to deliver lines like, I'm a pimp. And pimps don't commit suicide. 
By the way, this isn't just some cherry-picked awkward line. This line is repeated three times, the last of which is literally the final line of the movie. He is a pimp, and pimps don't commit suicide. I remember someone at the film festival asked Richard Kelly what this meant, and he gave a vague answer about American egoism in the face of moral defeat. To be honest, I felt bad for the guy. The film had recently been booed at the Cannes Film Festival, and I think he was still coming to terms with what he had spent years creating. Also, Dwayne Johnson does this bizarre thing with his fingers that feels forced every time he does it, and it seems like the only direction Justin Timberlake's character ever got was, look vaguely crazy. What makes this even more painful is how awesome his thinking was behind the casting choices. Kelly claims he was trying to make a piece of pop art, casting figures like The Rock, Sean William Scott, Sarah Michelle Gellar, Wallace Shawn, Mandy Moore, Christopher Lambert, John Lovitz, Amy Poehler, and still primarily a musician, Justin Timberlake. If you watched my other vlog on the movies that changed my life, you know I'm a big fan of Spring Breakers, so I love pop art. So it's all the more painful to me that all these actors just end up looking silly. But still, kudos to them for trusting a director with a strong vision that takes guts. Perhaps the easiest way to identify a bad movie is with its technical feats, such as editing, special effects, sound design, etc. Oftentimes, cheap-looking filmmaking can break the illusion and alienate the audience from the story. The editing, special effects, and production design in Southland Tales, however, are top-notch, and for me, that just makes it all the more tragic. The idea of having thousands of extremely talented people being paid to work on your sh idea hurts me in the feels way more than a low-budget ragtag team of filmmakers doing the best with what they have. If you have every tool at your disposal, including dump trucks full of money, and it still doesn't work, <sighs> ouch. Oh, and I can't not mention the part where Justin Timberlake spontaneously breaks out into a produced musical number, singing all these things that I've done by the killers in the middle of the movie for no apparent reason. With all these things that I've done. Up until this point, there were no other musical numbers, nor did we really know much about Timberlake's character. Kelly once described the scene as the heart of the movie, which makes no sense, but whatever. This hurts me because moments of magical realism and otherwise realistic narratives are one of my favorite things in movies. This scene in Trainspotting works so well, partly because it's a visual metaphor for heroin addiction. It drags you to the depths of squalor, but also allows you to experience serene beauty. This moment in Southland Tales, however, just feels random and try-hard. Now, some of you may be thinking that The Room also falls under this rubric of high ambitions but poor delivery. It, after all, aspired to be an emotional Tennessee Williams-esque narrative and ended up being, well, not that. You are lying. I never hit you. You are tearing me apart, Lisa! But here's the thing. Watching The Room is fun. Similarly, Troll 2 may be incompetently made, but if it can sell out a revival theater and people laugh their asses off the whole way through, it's clearly sparked joy and can't possibly be the worst movie ever. But Southland Tales isn't even laughably bad. It's just bad. In fact, it's the kind of bad where you're either constantly rolling your eyes or feeling bad for the filmmaker. You can see the ambition. You can see the tryhard. And honestly, you just feel a very slight sinking feeling in your stomach every time something that's supposed to be funny or profound fails to land. If you don't let me suck your I'm gonna kill myself. <sighs> to me, the worst movie ever made is an honor reserved for a film that makes you sigh more than it bores you. It's not so bad it's good. It's not fun to watch ironically. It's not fun to watch under the influence of any substances. It just hurts. It hurts bad enough to scare aspiring creatives from getting too ambitious, and that to me is a tragedy. Anyway, I'm curious to hear what some of your picks for the worst movie ever made is, and do you agree with my distinction between bad movies and tragic movies? Let me know what you guys think in the comments, and before you go, I want to give another shout out to our sponsors over at Honey, because who doesn't like free money? Just download the extension from joinhoney.com wisecrack to start getting access to discounts and promo codes on stuff you buy online. And as always, guys, thanks for watching. Peace.